uh, Tom Dejad, who I met a couple of years ago in Augusta. We were both testifying on some issue, a historical issue, I might add. And uh, one of the great things about that uh, was that he, he and I met. Them. I we hadn't come uh, talk last time on Arnold's last last to Quebec, and um, and that was such a great success that we thought we'd have him talk on the Civil War. And he has an outstanding background in the Civil War history, so it's a little bit delighted to have him here tonight. Uh, as you know, he uh, uh, has written uh, several books on the Civil War, part of his uh, uh, publishing group. Stan Fermi Boys from Maine, the 20th Maine, the Gettysburg Campaign, published at Oxford University Press. Uh, Those Not a Dead, How the Story of Gettysburg Shaped American Memory. And uh, Joshua L. Chamberlain, a handbook. Uh, um, which is a wonderful book too. So those three books and all kinds of other study, and of course I'm delighted to have him talk about Oxford County and uh, the Civil War, uh, because it's one of my interests too, so I'm, I'm sure everyone will be excited about this. Uh, I also must uh, mention the fact that we this uh, program is presented in part by a grant from the Maine Humanities Council, and uh, uh, Tom Jadden, uh, of course, is a graduate of Florida State, University, uh, his MA, BA, MA, and of course he holds his PhD from the University of Maine, and of course I can share that with him because we're delighted to have a fellow PhD from Maine. And uh, he's taught his alma mater, and of course he's also taught at Bowdoin College and the University of Maine. So without further ado, Tom Dejada. You know, I, eating at dinner, I, I, a day doesn't go by when something interesting about history in, in the news um, don't come together and, and remind me of something from our past, and usually Maine's past, which is always kind of neat. My ancestors settled in Maine in the 1630s, so, um, and my others came into Canada around 1613, and eventually they collided with the Lewiston generation before me, two generations. Um, and so, I, when I, that, that, which is where my love of Maine history comes from. It's like studying my family history, and in many ways it really is. Um, and when I watch the news and, and I see things happen, and I always, some Maine story tends to click in my head. The topic of conversation today has been um, on the news about how um, a fellow shouted out while the president was speaking in Congress, and people have, have you know, were aghast at how poor the decorum was and how terrible things are so partisan and I can't help but laugh and think for a few seconds about the time when Senator Sumner was speaking right before this just before the Civil War in the well of the Senate and said something that, that so angered a congressman that he came from the other side of the Capitol into the Senate and beat him to a bloody pulp with his cane. <laughs> it's a long way from, you lie! Oh, I'm sorry, I said that. <laughs> so it's funny how we always sort of look at our own time as the biggest, most important, most dramatic, and so on, but the, the partisanship prior to the Civil War was, was quite more dramatic. My other favorite one from about a year and a half of a year ago was when uh, Reverend Wright spoke, uh, and everyone blamed Obama for president. Now, and candidate Senator Obama for his speeches. And um, I was reminded of James G. Blaine, who most people have never heard of, and even people in Maine only sort of remember the name, and there's a house named after him somewhere. <laughs> uh, they don't realize that he was a shoe in to be the President of the United States back in the 1880s, and, uh, and, a, and a clear cut, absolute shoe in to be the President. He'd been quite a prominent Senate, you know, Speaker of the House, and so on. Uh, in October, Prior to the two weeks or so before the presidential election of that year, he was in New York for an event. Uh, in those days, big stage, outdoors, have to shout so people can hear you. And just prior to his taking this, the podium for his speech, which he had prepared well in advance, they didn't have teleprompters then, so you had to write it out on paper. And um, he, he gave his speech and left, uh, perhaps not realizing or perhaps not wanting to, that the fellow who spoke before him was a minister. Uh, Protestant minister, obviously, uh, who spoke and coined the phrase in that speech, Rum, Romanism, and Rebellion, as he identified the Democratic Party. Now, here, this is in, you know, 17 years out, 14, 15 years after the Civil War. But nevertheless, the Democrats had largely been considered those opposed to the war, the Civil War, and they were made up uh, in the New York area, in particular, a lot of Irish uh, folks, Tammany Hall, the political machine in New York. Uh, and so, um, they, that sort of kind of combined the Roman Romanism 
or papism as they often called it. And of course they supported the, the rebellion of the Civil War. Now, Blaine didn't say those words, probably had never heard of the minister prior to that speech, but he failed to be elected President of the United States two weeks later because of that speech. He was identified and connected to it because he didn't discount the, the minister's words. And he was in New York. Now, it turns out the fellow who he was running for president against was the governor of New York. And despite all of that, um, I'll get back to my computer then. Despite all of that, he still only lost New York by 1,000 votes. But those the New York electoral votes were enough to cost him the presidency. And he was never elected president afterward, obviously. And so I, when that whole series of discussions was going on about the Reverend Wright and, and now President Obama uh, not disclaiming his words and so on, I, I couldn't help but think of James G. Blaine um, and how he might have been smiling up saying, ha, I'm not the only one. It just took 100 clear <laughs> 29 years for somebody else to get bit by the same bug. So uh, I can't watch the news without, you know, making some connection. It seems like almost every day there's some interesting Civil War period connection or main history connection. And just at the time my computer finally went to sleep, it'll come back on. Um, I want to thank Stan for inviting me back, which is, you know, pretty good after having to put up with me a year and a half ago. So, uh, but Stan said, why don't you come speak on the Civil War? And I said, well, talk about the Civil War in Oxford County. And then it occurred to me, I'm talking to Stan Howe. So how the heck am I going to say that? <laughs> I got some nerve to come to Oxford County and talk about the Civil War in Oxford County with Stan in the room. So, I decided to do something a little bit different, you know, instead of talking about all the soldiers and generals and battles they fought in and so on. I have some of that. But I wanted to talk a little bit about um, some things that people don't always get to hear about. I heard that Vista Windows log up noise. That's either a good or a bad thing, so I don't want to configure the updates. Just come back. There we go. Uh, so I thought I would talk about some things that Stan probably knows, but you don't, and he might not get around to writing about because it isn't necessarily individually the most exciting, but taken as a whole, it's kind of interesting. And that is, um, although Stan has written about this in a sort of different way, um, what, um, what was going on and what it was like to, to walk down the street or be a part of the daily discussion here in Oxford County, and in Maine in general, but mostly here in the county, uh, when the Civil War broke out and during, and what it was like to try and make that all work, and the challenges that people back here faced, um, and, and the mechanisms that made the war happen, because it was a very, very expensive war in a country whose gross national product was a fraction of what we think of it today. Most people farmed, and most people who farmed were subsistence farmers. They just fed themselves. So there wasn't a lot of cash being poured into the federal government. In fact, they invented income tax in the middle of the war in order to pay for the war. So all of it had to be paid for. Every bullet, every musket, every powder, uh, every bit of powder, most of which, by the way, came from down in Gorham and Wyndham. Uh, the Gorham Wyndham powder mills provided 50% of the, of the powder uh, for the war effort to the Union Army, actually the Union Navy more than the Army. But, um, and a lot of other things happened up here in Maine. There was the fellow here in the county, I can't remember exactly where, who supplied a lot of the paper uh, to the government. Um, not too far from Bethel. I remember we used to drive by. Interestingly enough, the paper that he provided <coughs> about halfway through the war, um, we invented the pulp paper process, or we at least made it much more popular. Paper prior to the later part of 1863 was made from rags rather than from pulp, as we look at it today, wood products. And um, the rags prior to that were hard to find if you had a big rush like the Civil War. No war was ever fought with more paper than the Civil War. If you remember in the National Archives, you understand what that's like. And the red tape we still talk about today is a little red ribbon. You folded the papers a certain way and then wrapped these little red ribbon around and tied them together. Rather than manila file folders, you'd bundle packages of letters that were related to one another, wrap a piece of tape around it, and tie a little bow. If you go to the National Archives today, it will give you some of these records, and you can literally be the first person ever, since it was tied up in 1862 or three, to untie that red tape and look at the paperwork. So that phrase, red tape, is really kind of a red ribbon from those days. And some of that was made just south of Bethel by a fellow, and I bet some of you might know, but does anyone know whether he, he ran out of rags early, prior to the war, really, but with, with this huge rush of need for rags from the government, he needed a source of cloth. Does anyone know where he got it from? One of those local stories right here. He got them from Egyptian mummies. 
<laughs> they shipped dead Egyptian bodies, not the pharaoh and his son, but all regular folks, over here to Oxford County, and he took the rags apart and used them to make paper as long as he could, until eventually the paper process that we know today, the pulp company. It, it, you can tell very clearly, if you go through a, a set of uh, papers from the Civil War time, and if they're done by year, the 1863 papers are still pretty thick, the ink looks really nice and strong, and they're solid paper, almost like parchment. And when you look at the 84, it's thinner paper, the ink fades, and it's, you can tell there's a whole shift in process. <coughs> there are a lot of daily stories like that that happen that, that essentially what we think of as a sewing machine was invented. It used to be a great big machine, but they found a way to flip it upright, make it smaller, and put it in a small space so a woman could sit and sew instead of having to go to a big factory. And they could farm out and piecework some of the cloth. And so <coughs> Maine was a very prominent cloth-making area, too, because most of the cloth, unfortunately, for some Union soldiers, at least most of the year, was made from wool, was, was wool rather than cotton. And the sheep, other than in Vermont, no sheep, no group of sheep grew more wool per sheep than here in Maine. <laughs> they that fast. Uh, but because of the cold climate, the sheep here produced more wool per sheep. So uh, it was a great place to make, and Maine is full of rivers and hills. So you could build a fairly small woolen factory almost anywhere in Maine, as long as you had some water that fell a certain distance over a certain distance. And the sheep were usually around. If you just got the farmers to convert to sheep or add some sheep to their livestock, you could bring in the wool and, and make a, a pretty good living and employ eight or ten people, uh, mostly women, by the way, uh, who could go to work in the mill and make cloth. And the Union soldiers wore cloth, a lot of which came from Maine. What's also interesting about that is, and this goes on many years, my great aunt in Lewiston uh, remembers that one of the first things she knew when she came, she got to be a teenager in Lewiston, and they would go to church on the weekends. They were Catholic who isn't in Lewiston, and um, they would go, and she would see the other girls her age or a little older had new shoes that they only wore to church on Sunday, and she thought that was the greatest thing in the world. Now, she turned out to be the spinster of the family. She never did marry, uh, but she, her whole life goal then was to go somehow make some money, some cash money, and buy a pair of shoes that they could <coughs> only wear on the weekend. So she went to work in the shoe store, not the mill like everybody else, but in the shoe store, and bought her pair, several pair of shoes. And I, later on realized that I was studying the town of Sebec, and the small woolen mill with about 10 or 15 employees, all women. And I realized that women who grew up in a home in Maine, especially a rural farm home, had no alternative to do anything except become a spinster, literally sit at a spinning wheel and spin to contribute to their parents' households by weaving cloth or spinning or sewing or doing something around the house, unless the husband came along and then she went off and made her own home. So spinsters like that in particular could, uh, and, and younger women who weren't quite sure who they wanted to marry yet, could go work in the mill for, for cash income, which was not always that common, and not only supplement their family's income, allow their father to buy a new piece of farming equipment or more seed next year or what have you, but also have a little bit of money for themselves. And if Joe Simpson came from next door and wanted to court and she didn't quite like him, she could say, I don't have to marry this year because I have my own money. It's not a lot. But so there was a sort of a change in the personality when the Industrial Revolution and the Civil War accelerated that tremendously. Because all over Maine, when men went to war and women stayed behind and did the work. It wasn't quite like Rosie the Riveter, but there was, a, for example, a, a sail making, sail cloth making company in Rockland that shifted over to tent making. But the men were gone, so the women stepped in and made cloths and, and brought cash home, which was an unusual thing for them, and could kind of do whatever they wanted with it. Suddenly they had some authority and some influence, and uh, in addition to the work that they did helping soldiers. Um, in a nutshell, the, the state of Maine, the, the network that women put together on their own to aid soldiers, both in sending them supplies and goodies and so forth, but also in bringing medical treatment to them in their tents, which no other women had ever done uh, in warfare, uh, was created in something called the Maine Camp Hospital Association, where women got so good at the process that not a single package sent from Maine failed to reach the soldier it was sent to at the front in the course of the war. And they beat the Postal Service by about four days in getting a package. So men would, people would avoid the post, sending it by mail and just give it to one of these women and it would get there quicker. And the women would literally take it right to the soldier's tent and would hand it to him through the flap of the tent if he was sick and in his tent. Soldiers didn't like to go to the hospital back then because a lot of many people came back. They would go to, the hospital with, <laughs> go to the hospital with a sore ankle and come back with pneumonia. You know, you would go to this disease-ridden place. 
And a lot of the men wouldn't leave their tents, and so the main women figured this system where they would go as horrible as it was for a woman to see a man in his tent or be, on, be in camp and be considered a camp follower or a laundress, which was code word for something else, uh, they, uh, they would bring these things to the soldiers in their tents. And eventually, one of them, a man from Pennsylvania, was heard later on to have said, uh, after watching the care that the Maine men got versus other states, they said, the next time I enlist, it'll be in a Maine regiment. <laughs> because there was an enormous outpouring of supplies and goods and, and, and a system privately developed by women for this purpose. And really started by a woman whose son, <laughs> poor fellow, she followed him off to war. She was home alone uh -huh. with him. He went off to war, so she went too. And I can just imagine the poor guy that asked my mother's company. <laughs> but after a while, she would get a wagon and collect. He would say, you know, this Bill and Pete and Joe are back. And they can't even get out of their tent. They're so sick. She goes, well, let's move you back in the major city to the rear. And she'd borrow a wagon or steal it and take it to the camp and deliver food and come back. And before long, the generals were saying, give her three wagons. Take her everything she wants. Because she works in a camp and goes to these units and the men are healthy and survive and, and prosper. So then she got women back here making things and packaging things and sending it down and she would receive it there addressed to her and, and distribute it and others helped and so on. So there was this uh, interestingly concerted effort. Now there's a lot of scholarship done on this that as soon as the people would think then well then the Civil War must have been a big deal in helping women into areas of, of spheres of influence, areas of things uh, that they hadn't had before, and it must have been a big boon for women to have all these doors open to them. And in a way, it's true, they were given the right to vote 60 years later. Uh, and so generally, the, the acknowledgement is that while they were allowed for the period of the war to do things they might not otherwise have been able to do because of the necessity, as soon as the men came home and the war ended, as I sort of describe it, the genie was shoved back in the bottle, literally and figuratively. Um, and a lot of those sort of rights and things were taken away because it, that was just, because there was an emergency, not permanently. But it began, and so the seeds for really the, the temperance movement, which has almost all of its roots in Maine, which led to the, um, uh, well, contributed to the abolition movement, but led to the women's rights movement we hear about Susan B. Anthony and others until 1920. Uh, and so Maine women were sort of involved in that. So the Civil War did sort of contribute to create enough women who, who realized that, that they could do things, that it took 60 more years, but eventually got women the right to vote and those other things. So the Civil War temporarily gave women this, this interest, including women up in this area, but it, it gave them something to do other than being at home. Go down to a, what they used to call it sanitary fairs. The sanitary commission would have a fair, and women would gather and, and collect things or look for donations or quilts or make socks and, and those sorts of things. So it gave them a social chance to be out of the home. I put up the logo here for the Civil War sesquicentennial because I just like to say sesquicentennial <laughs> because it took me six months to say it right. Uh, but the obviously it begins in a year and a half, two years, a year and a half. Well, we got to start in April of, of uh, 2011. Uh, and if you go to maine.gov slash Civil War, you'll see nothing but that logo right now. But very soon you will see lots and lots of information about events that will be taking place. The, the commission is not, there's a commission set up, and most states have one. It's not planning events, it's just simply making people aware of the events that different historical societies and towns and people are reenactors and so on putting together. Uh, but we are going to put up a lot of photographs from the Civil War period, photographs of all of the Civil War monuments in Maine that uh, Earl Shuttleworth with the Maine Historic Preservation Commission has been working on. Every single one of them, and there's some you won't believe that you think there's that one there. And we're even looking into trying to find all the ones that are not in the, uh, outside of the major battlefields, because there's some really strange places where there are monuments uh, that Maine people put up for one reason or another during the Civil War. So keep an eye on that, maine.gov slash Civil War. Uh, in a couple of months, you'll start seeing lots of other interesting um, things. And I'll throw this plug in just so I can say I did. Uh, on uh, Columbus Day weekend, so October, I think it's 10, 11, 12, there's the Maine Military Historical Society is taking a busload of folks to Gettysburg for three days. Well, the days drive down and the days drive back and a whole day there. Um, and so I'm supposed to plug that too. So if anyone's interested, ask me afterward. Uh, we leave from Augusta in Portland. Um, and so we'll spend a whole day on the battlefield and um, a bunch of uh, military interested people and retired military people and um, 
just go have a dinner and a lunch, a bag lunch and a banquet and a cookout and some other things. So you've never been to Gettysburg or for a while and you feel like riding the bus down with a bunch of old military parts. <laughs> like, like me. Uh, and then we're going to do it. It's not, they're, they're not a military touristic group. They're, they want to be sponsored by pale, by uh, shipyard beer, so they're fun and not all stuff. Uh, anyway, so that's the, uh, the logo of the sesquicentennial. Now, it's different to talk about the Civil War up here. I, I often talk about it down on the coast because um, they didn't want a Civil War down on the coast. And we talk about how Maine, went, by the time the war was over, had provided more troops per, as a percentage of the state population. I say troops, more men in the service. A lot of them were in the Navy, um, for obvious reasons, leaders could sail. Um, more Mainers served in the Union Army or and Navy during the Civil War than per, as a percentage of the state's population than any other state. Uh, but that was not, so you would think, wow, this, these are people really committed to the war and, and they really uh, must have been very fervent for it. But when the war, well, the week before the war broke out, from the election of Lincoln in November of 1860 uh, until the outbreak of the war just after his inauguration in April of 61, People in Maine were very much against the idea of going to war with the South. And it doesn't really, it isn't very complicated to understand why when you realize that most of the people, at least along the coast in Maine, were, were committed to a, a part of the shipping industry, whether it was cutting the logs down to build the ships with, or cutting the logs down to put on the ships to sail somewhere else, or building the ships, or sailing the ships, or putting your cargo on the ships. Uh, shipping was what Maine did. Um, in addition to lumbering, and a lot of the lumbering was uh, trees were cut into lumber and taken by ship somewhere else. So the idea of cutting off every port from Baltimore south from that trade for any period of time, their customers, as people used to kid, to cut off not only that they had customers and sometimes their families in ports all across the south, from you know Savannah and Wilmington all the way around, and even into Texas, uh, and all these people had relatives, friends that they often did commerce with and enjoyed in these ports. So the idea that suddenly that would be cut off and would destroy the shipping industry in Maine uh, and badly damage almost every industry in the state was not something that took very lightly. Slavery was not an issue, although there were a number of abolitionists in the state. It was not a major issue to people here simply because there weren't any around. Slavery was not something you witnessed on a regular basis in Maine, and it just didn't necessarily hit home. Uh, in a passionate way to everyone here. So this idea was bad. Now, of the um, 35 newspapers, actually there were 47 published in Maine in 1860, but of the 35 we could find, 15 of them favored candidates other than Abraham Lincoln, and only 20 of the 47 that we found favored Lincoln, endorsed Lincoln. Now, there's a little bit of a bias there in that most newspapers in those days were owned by the party, the Republican Journal. Uh, and Stan, you're just you're telling me about the one Oxford Democrat, the Oxford Democrat, the Republican paper. It was it became a Republican paper. <laughs> so that that before 1910, 1912, and, and um, Pulitzer and uh, and all those other folks came along, Hearst newspapers generally were an organ of the party. And I don't mean the way we describe that today, but I mean literally they were owned by the political party. So part of it is that. But if you look, even the Franklin uh, Patriot supported um, another candidate other than Abraham Lincoln. So there was not this great fervor to go to war, um, and frankly, the, the probability of war was really the issue in the election in 1860, whether or not um, the South would secede if Lincoln was elected, which was pretty clear. So contrary to what you may think necessarily off the top of your head, people were not excited about going to war. However, when the South fired on Fort Sumter, and really when the states began to secede in the South, there was an enormous shift in people's uh, point of view. They didn't want the war to come, but when it came, then being provided more troops and, and sailors to the cause than any other state as a percentage of our population. And as I said, there are 628,000 people, really, twice, we'll only have twice as many now, about half the population of the state now. Never in the history of our country has there been anything like the spirit aroused by the virtual declaration of war on the part of the Confederate States. The firing on Fort Sumter, everybody, well, everybody between the ages of 18 and 25 wanted to grab a musket and be in Virginia tomorrow. <laughs> and a whole lot of other people outside of that age 
So there, once the, the, the die was cast, or the gauntlet was thrown down, or whatever phrase you want to use, Maine was enormously in favor and supportive of the war and the war effort and the soldiers and joining. But up until the last possible moment, they really would rather not have lost that commerce. After that, when there's a fight on, we're going to join and we're going to go. And so uh, there was a tremendous outpouring. In the 1860 uh, election, there were 100,000 votes cast in Maine. Now, that's one thing to point out. Um, that's one out of every six people remembering that women didn't vote. So this is one out of 300,000 males. And if you take out those too young, it's probably about half of the people eligible to vote. And keeping in mind, a lot of fishermen, a lot of sailors aren't around to vote because they're not in their, you know, they're out to sea or what have you. So it was a pretty good voter turnout vote. Lincoln got 62% of the votes cast in Maine, and then Breckinridge, Bell, Douglas being the northern Democrat, um, but not necessarily a slaver Democrat, so to speak, but in favor of the, the it was a complicated election. The Democrats split uh, south and north. Uh, and so see, uh, Lincoln did get twice as many votes as any other candidate, but it wasn't 80, 75, 80, 85 percent, as people might think now, uh, in terms of Maine's opinion. Uh, in the 1860 election, for example, just one thing from the county of Woodstock, Maine, there were, th which is a long way from the coast and therefore not as affected by the possibility of cutting off shipping. Uh, so in Woodstock, only six votes went to anti-war candidates for president. Almost every vote went to Lincoln. Um, 79 men served in the war from uh, Woodstock. 204 men voted in 1860. That gives a sense of really strong turnout. And of the 204 votes, 198 of them went to Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> so, um, or, yeah, for Abraham Lincoln. So, uh, you get a sense that this, the further away you went from the coast, the less the possibility of commerce being dramatically affected, and uh, the more people were in favor of the war. And I'm going to, I'll charge this out, I, it's too easy to just give the stand, but if anybody wants to look this up and confirm this for me. I discovered not long back in a book, Right after a few a week after Fort Sumter, Massachusetts troops, well, regiment of Massachusetts troops were on their way to really to protect Washington, not the person but the city. And um, they, on their way through Baltimore, had to change um, trains. So they got off one train and were marching through the streets to get on the other train. And a riot broke out. People started throwing bricks and everything else at the soldiers. And much like the uh, Boston Massacre, a couple of shots were fired, and before long, what we now think of as the Baltimore Riot took place. Three men in the Massachusetts unit were killed. Two of them we know came from Lowell, and we know were born in Massachusetts. The third is said to have come from Oxford County, Maine, originally. He's said to have joined the regiment in Boston. But it went from Lowell to Boston, eventually to Baltimore. Uh, and that's all we know about him, except for this mention that he was originally from Oxford County. By coincidence, one of the Lowell men was actually born in Waldo County. So two of the three people, of the first casualties of the Civil War, were uh, from Maine. One of them, apparently, Charles, this mysterious Charles A. Taylor, was from Oxford County. I've seen him mentioned, but I've never been able to actually find him, uh, or his birth record or something like that. Tom, I think there was a James Needham, I think his name was. I'm not sure on that. but. Uh who was Norway Bethel Connections, and I think he was the first one killed. Is he another one there? Okay. okay. So he's maybe could be. one of the third ones, but I'm, I'm not sure that name is right, but I think it's It could be the right, and that's another one of those things that's so vague, except that somebody, in one of the books that's actually made in the Civil War, they mentioned one of the first casualties from Oxford County, and you, you can eliminate the others by their birthright, this Charles Taylor was the odd one. So anyway, one of the first people killed in the Civil War, two, were, two of the three were from Maine. One of them was from Oxford County, at least the records that exist to tell us. He was serving in a Massachusetts regiment, but isn't that always the way? Massachusetts gets all our credit. Gee. <laughs> so, um, in Oxford County, yep, the Seventh Grade Battery. Oxford County sent 4,216 men to the war, yeah. which accounted for 6% of the total of men uh, who went off be from Maine. 71,000 people roughly served for Maine. But you have to keep in mind of that total, a large number, not, a, not half, but a large number were sailors because they were sailors and so they joined the Navy. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you cut out those coastal people who went off and served the ho most horrible duty on the, um, uh, we call them embargo, but blockade ships, mm -hmm. it just sat and baked in the southern sun, blockading a port for three years. Never moved, no one ever tried to run the blockade, mm -hmm. it just sat. 
on these miserable ships in a hostile harbor, um, and it was awful duty. But at the same time, no one was firing a cannon at them or shooting at them on a regular basis. So uh, it's probably a higher percentage of Maine's infantry and artillery than cavalry total. Uh, but nevertheless, 4,200 men from Oxford County served in the war at one time or another, almost all of them on the ground as opposed to the ocean. Uh, and that doesn't include a whole bunch of men, particularly up in this part of the state, who served elsewhere. I mean, born here, grew up here, and then went to Massachusetts, or happened to just be over in New Hampshire, and then enlisted in one of those regiments. Now, um, recruiting a soldier was interesting, <laughs> and it's sometimes funny. There's a recruiting paper there that was signed by every enlistee. Uh, there were a couple of requirements, very, very few requirements, that you had to have in order to be recruited as a soldier. And I'll explain the recruiting process in a minute. But the first one is you were supposed to be between 18 to 45 years old. And if you happen to have left your driver's license at home, and there was no way to prove how old you actually were, and the person doing the recruiting wanted as many people as he could. So it wasn't like he was trying to keep you out, like being carted at a, at a package store trying to get a six pack. He wanted you to get in line to be a recruit. So soldiers did things like they put a piece of paper with a number 18 written on it in their shoe. And when the, when the recruiting officer questioned them and said, are you over 18? They would say, I stand on my statement. I am over 18. <laughs> it is I. And there are a number of letters. My son went off, and he wasn't, he's only 16, and he didn't have permission. Lots of letters to and from the governor and the adjutant general. Mother's trying to find lost sons, and the father's mad because the son you know, snuck off and so on. You had to have two opposing fingers on the right hand, and you could oppose these any two as long as you could grab hold of the ramrod that pushed the bullet down into the musket. And you were trained when that happened, and you returned the ramrod to do so with your pinky. So if the gun went off accidentally, you could just move on to the next finger. <laughs> but you had to, you think I'm kidding, but you had to be able to remove the ramrod, turn it around, push the bullet down into the gun, pull the ramrod out. So you needed two fingers that opposed each other. It didn't matter which two. You could grab a ramrod and do that. And you'd start with your pinky to return it back into its holding place and fire and pull it back out again. So you needed two opposing fingers. And very critically, you needed, this was oftentimes a, a struggle, you needed two opposing teeth. Because when you took the paper cartridge out of, your, out of the box on your belt, full of gunpowder and a bullet, you needed to bite on it, tear it, pour the bullet in the musket, pinch the, uh, pour the powder in the musket, pinch the bullet out of the little paper tube, and then ram it in. But you had to, the way the manual of arms was, you had to hold the musket, tear the powder, pour it in. Well, you can't hold the musket and tear the powder, even with two opposing fingers. <laughs> you can't be doing this on a battlefield. So you needed to have two teeth in your mouth, one on top, one on bottom, that opposed each other enough you could grab a piece of paper. And they would literally inspect. To me, I don't know if they gave a piece of paper to bite on this, but uh, you had to, that was pretty much it. You could be any height, short, tall, fat, thin, because recruiting worked a little bit, a lot, like this. Um, you were a prominent citizen. You were a clerk at the drugstore. You were a well-known fellow, maybe a young lawyer. You would write to the governor, and which really meant the adjutant general. The governor was mostly a figurehead in those days. And these letters all still exist down in the state archives, which is great fun to read on many occasions. Uh, and you would say to the governor, and two or three letters of recommendation with you, I am a prominent <coughs> fellow, and I know a little bit about military things, and I'm willing to recruit men, and so on and so forth. Would you please send me blanks? And the blanks are these sheets of paper without any of the writing filled in yet. And if the adjutant general thought that you seemed like a fine young gentleman quite well recommended, or knew your uncle or something, he would send you blanks and authorize you to recruit soldiers. And Originally, the state would give a bounty of like $50, $20, $50. It grew very quickly after the, after the original to sign up. And these fervent, mostly young gentlemen in the first year would go out and recruit soldiers. When they would get oh, 30 or 25, 30, 40 of them, they would send a note down to the governor, meaning the adjutant general, saying, I've collected these men, what shall I do? And the adjutant general will say, report to Augusta to be mustered in with the regiment on the such and such date of such and such a month. They would then arrive, let's say at Augusta, along with other men around the state who had collected 30 or 40 of these recruits in tow and gotten them to sign a sheet of paper and gotten a, an examining physician to look the other way whether their teeth were lined up or not. And they would be hustled into camp 
and organized by company. And the, well, the other issue too up here, and there, was, there were two militia companies, for example, here in Bethel. The militia companies sometimes were sent whole as a unit. They were people who had been in the militia prior to the war. Uh, at least those capable of going would go. And they would take with them their company officers as they had been before the war. But aside from that, the governor got to choose for each company of infantrymen, meaning 100 soldiers, at least as they started out. There were 10 companies in a regiment, so 1,000 men. The governor had the great advantage of being able to appoint two lieutenants and a captain, and then eventually a major lieutenant colonel and colonel for the regiment. All these political papers. But by and large, the man who got to be the captain of the military company was the man who had recruited the most people. He didn't have to know which end of the gun the bullet came out of. But if he had talked 40-some men into joining, he was in charge of those men, and that's how you got your commission. Not the best way to fight a war, or at least begin organizing. And here's what one of those recruiters, he happened to be down in Wiscasset, but years later he described it, because he was one of them. Uh, he said, uh, explain, nor was the process of selecting line officers, meaning officers for the, for the company, by their ability or success in persuading their neighbors to enlist, a severe test of military fitness. However, these considerations did not trouble the governor nor the impromptu recruiting officer who did not foresee them. He had no experience whatsoever in this line of business and fortunately did not look so far ahead. To say that as a rule he was utterly green in military matters is to do injustice to the words. <laughs> However, he might be credited with some enterprise and even audacity for such certainly were required in a young man given to serious reflection who should propose to organize a military company and to command it in the field when he scarcely knew a line of battle from a line of rail fence. <laughs> Amongst those raising companies were young lawyers who had perhaps learned to draw an indictment, but who would not then have been able to draw anything in the military line unless it was rations or the enemy's fire. There were schoolmasters whose only qualifications for getting men to the front and keeping them there were based on experience in teaching young ideas how to shoot. There were farmers, clerks, and fellows just out of college, some graduates, some undergraduates, but with not a tried or known military qualification in the whole squad. This regiment, the 20th Maine Regiment, gathered without a single person in the unit who had ever been a part of a military exercise, much less seen a battle or what have you. So there was small effort at sifting, as he called it, making sure you get rid of the, the, the dead weight. The results were sometimes even ludicrous. One fellow, too short, was passed in high-heeled shoes and grew shorter as time and his shoes wore on. <laughs> but he made an excellent soldier. Another passed muster in black beard, which soon after disclosed an ever-widening zone of gray, and he became a veteran prematurely. He <laughs> polished his beard dark and he could appear younger. More obscure bodily defects developed in the first hard campaign and speedily furnished ample material for the hospital and pension roll. However, by hook or crook, the ten companies were raised and from various quarters were transported at the governor's expense to the camp where they were organized into a regiment. So basically, you said to the governor, I'm a pretty nice guy, send me some blanks. You hung a poster out, you set up a little office, and you started signing guys up. And if you get 30 or 40 of them, you could be their captain. You no idea what you're doing, but you could get to buy your own uniform and your own sword, but you get to go off and be a captain. And uh, Originally, the towns and the state provided bounties of a fairly small amount, less than $100 altogether, because everyone wanted to join. In fact, it was a whole group of people, enough to almost form a 72 people in the county here, who wrote to the governor and said, we're ready to go. And he says, I got too many already, so stay there, and maybe next time. The president would call for X number of troops, 100,000 troops, and they would be divided by state based on population. So the main quota would be X number of troops, let's say three regiments, so 3,000 troops, and the governor would then send out the word, we need 3,000 troops. And as these men would send in these uh, recruitment papers, I get 50, okay, send them to Augusta, and then these 40 go to Bangor, and these so on and so forth. And before long, they would have 1,000 people in each of the three places. They'd make a regiment, put officers in them, and put them on a train. None of them knew how to fight. The 20th Maine left with only two companies with muskets. Everybody else had nothing. <laughs> they went without rifles to the war. Uh, but that was the way, because the politics of it were to provide for the Republican president, most of the, the governor was Republican, and most of the local people had become so, and they were to provide, do their duty to provide as a political way. But also, the people who got bent in the front were much appreciated. Abraham Lincoln and others were very grateful to the states and counties who had provided troops at a time when Washington was undefended and the Confederates were raising troops faster and so on. 
So eventually, over time, there were drafts. If not enough people volunteered, then the state would create a draft. And they would divide that by county and by town and say that this town's quota is four people. And by 1864, that was not easy to do because anybody who really wanted to go had gone. And the stories coming back from the front weren't exactly very exciting. So soldiers were hard to come by and new recruits. And eventually, the bounty into 65 got up to almost $500. By and large, it was about two or three hundred for the average soldier during the course of the war. Uh, and the towns would raise the bounty because if Bethel was offering, you know, if the state would offer, say, a hundred bucks, and Bethel would kick in a hundred, make it two hundred, but Rumford was given two fifty. And so some of these guys might sneak over to Rumford and sign up there and go off to war with an extra fifty bucks. The problem was, and, and the, the letters down in the, to the governor and Andrew general in Augusta in the archives now are filled with. Jimmy Smith comes from Bethel. He's been here his whole life. He was born here. His parents are born here. And he's on Rumford's quota. And we demand that he be moved. And the poor town selectmen were inundated with all of these issues. They had to raise soldiers. They had to make sure they met the quota. Otherwise, there would be a draft in the town. And if you were a town selectman and you allowed a draft to happen, you weren't really doing a very good job. Uh, and the pressure on them to just, in terms of the providing military troops to the front, was enormous over the course of the war. Keeping the quotas down, raising enough bounty to not have to do a draft, and fighting to get soldiers who had, uh, and they did a lot of things, like one soldier that, in one of the towns nearby joined the New Hampshire Regiment, because he just happened to be there. But they wanted to get him put on their town's quota, because he had been born and raised here, and so they're writing the Adjutant General who's saying, not even serving the state. I mean, like, he's in New Hampshire. So there's all of this paperwork in Bickering trying to uh, meet a quota. And that's what it was like for some poor selectmen at that point in time. But the recruiting fellows went off with their recruits and became soldiers and officers of the companies. Now, here's one of the letters, for example, and I left in the misspellings. <laughs> this one made me kind of laugh as I first read it, because I thought, that doesn't seem right. To the governor, dear sir, we've traveled this part of the country and have been as far as Brompton Falls, Canada, but have not enlisted a man. It is out of the question to enlist men in this vicinity, and I don't think it very probable that there will be any. And it goes on, though, blah, 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 blah. So it, all over this part of the state, Oxford County, up into Canada, we couldn't find a soldier. <clears throat> but the eight days, seven days later, the governor got a letter saying, your dispatch asked me to have all my recruits at Augusta this week as re is received. I answer, in answer, I'll say that all diligence is carrying out. In other words, this guy, a whole bunch of recruits are already lost, signed up and ready to go. But this other two guys couldn't find a single man from here to Brompton Falls, Canada. <laughs> so you get kind of differing reports on how many. Although in the next sentence, they, they said they probably tapped out. The, the This is the early September 1861. So this is very shortly after, not very long after the Battle of Bull Run. Um, or, or Manassas, if you're of Southern persuasion. Um, so. All of the people who really rushed to the front and wanted to join up right away had pretty much done so by this time. And it was the summer of 62 when that second wave of people, everyone, no one at any time believed the war was ever going to last more than another two months. For four years, no one ever had conceived of it lasting more than another month or two. And so by September of that year, they had kind of waned, um, the, the enthusiasm had waned, the men who wanted to fight had gone, um, and they were still looking for them. But he said, uh, I can show you it's been hard recruiting up here in the past, but as secession was killed on Monday, there was a battle. For the future, is it will be better, at least I hope so, <laughs> said Benjamin Freeman, who was trying to recruit people up here in September, after the big first wave of soldiers went. And here is uh, earlier, this is now right after, or right around the time of the Battle of Bull Run, so we have a, other, a couple months after Fort Sumter. Young men of this place, to the number 72, had formed themselves into a company called the Bethel Zouaves Cadets. Zouaves were a, another, were, it was a militia company, but they based their dress largely on a French uh, militia, or French army unit that was based in Africa. So they had kind of these, uh, they looked like something out of uh, India or something. They had these kind of blousy, baggy pants and gators up to their knees, and a turban for a hat, and it was a, a kind of a crack corps in Napoleon's army, where, you know, the fancy dress, and they, they were very spit and polished, and they drilled very nicely, and it became kind of well-known. So the Zouaves, were just, they dressed fancy, and they tried
tried very hard to outdrill the other companies and be you know tougher fighters and so on. So the zoo, but the zoo have cadets. Cadets are those just learning. So it's kind of a we're the really great just starting out guys, <laughs> and have been perfecting ourselves in the hardy tactics. There were two books on military tactics at those times that talked about the pinky and the ramrod and all that. One was Casey's and one was Hardy's. They were relatively similar. So they were using that textbook, sort of. And they were desirous of having muskets to render ourselves more efficient in drill. Kind of matters to learn how to fight. It's like being in basketball practice without a ball. Muskets are sort of important. And notice he said muskets, not rifles, although the, the words are sort of interchangeable. Then. And there's a whole bunch of other letters at the, at the State Archives. The Adjutant General trying to find cannons and muskets and powder and trying to give the, on the state level, trying to make sure all of these men had the things to fight with, uniforms, coats, tents, all of that stuff. And the state had to find a way to get it and pay for it, which meant the towns had to pay the state and the people had to pay taxes. And so it was an enormous undertaking financially. We have another company, <laughs> this always rivalry, we have another company here called the Home Guards. We have no fellowships with them. Please don't mistake us for those guys. <laughs> Please do answer whether we can have some muskets or not. Yours truly, C.H. Harris. And this is right after the Battle of Bull Run. So uh, lots of these kinds of letters or people back here, 72 men, that's a full company without its you know, nine commissioned officers and so on. So they're ready to go, but it's two months after the first regiment, the Maine's first regiment had gone out with a number of people from Oxford County. So the second call for troops isn't here. After the Battle of Bull Run, the president said, oh crap, we need some more soldiers. <laughs> we lost that one. And so the, these men will probably go off as almost an entire company, I think in the fifth man, memory serves, if not correctly. Mm -hmm. um, there were three recipients of the Medal of Honor from uh, the county. What interesting though, <coughs> none of these uh, qualifies under this circumstance, but by the middle of the war, the Medal of Honor was the only medal that the Army had, so it was given out for a lot of reasons. And quite literally, by the Battle of Gettysburg, middle of the war, if you were walking to the loo, <laughs> to the field, to the to the bathroom bush, and tripped over a Confederate flag that had been laying there for a week, and you picked it up and turned it in, they literally traded that for a Medal of Honor. If you brought a battle flag to, so whether you captured it in battle or tripped over on the way to the head, you were literally given a Medal of Honor as a matter of circumstance. So at Gettysburg, there were guys who came up with armloads of them because after the Confederates retreated from Pickett's Charge, they just went and cleaned up the battlefield. Well, there were flags laying everywhere, and the guys would just come walking back. What do I do with these, General? And you know, give one to him, give one to him, and all those guys got medals of honor. My great, 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 great grandfather, Enoch Simpson, and that's a meaner if I ever heard it, was minted, had a medal of honor minted for him. To my knowledge, he never received it for refusing to stay in Washington when Abraham Lincoln asked him to. Because the 27th Maine, recipients of 832 Medals of Honor, the most decorated unit in the history of warfare, were in a hole with cannons in it around Washington, a fort. Around Washington is a 90-day regiment when Lee invaded Pennsylvania just before the Battle of Gettysburg. Their enlistment ended on June 30th, and of course the Battle of Gettysburg is July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. Terrified that Lee would invade Washington, Lincoln and the War Department asked the 27th Maine to stay in the fort and continue to defend Washington. And if they did, they would give him a medal. There was only one medal in the Army at that time. 300 or so of the men said, sure, we'll stay another two weeks. 500 and some, including my grandfather, said, yeah, I'm going home, my 90 days is up. By some mistake in the War Department, all the muster roll with all 832 names was sent and the medals were minted and made for all of the soldiers. If you were to look for it, and a friend of mine did, in the 1960s, Civil War Medals of Honor, about half of them that existed in coin collect shops and so on were from the 17th Maine. I mean, I'm sorry, the 27th Maine. So what, what we think happened was that they were put in a barrel and sent to the colonel, I think he lived in Brunswick, uh, and said, give these out. In 19, 1892, they were all taken back. Uh, they revised the medal and fixed it, took a lot of the old medals back. Not that they physically took them back, but they just took the men off the list. Uh, and at some point in time, they stayed probably in that colonel's attic, but at some point, probably in the 19, early 1900s, they got out. Um, not to the soldiers, but just out. And so there's still 16th Maine, uh, 27th Maine medals around. But these fellows got it for the old-fashioned reasons. Ephraim Harrington from at the Battle of Fredericksburg, second Battle of Fredericksburg in May, really kind of the Battle of Chancellorsville. 
in May of 63, uh, entered service at Kirby, Vermont, but he was from Waterford, carried the colors to the top of the heights and almost to the muzzle of the enemy's guns. Uh, Captain Augustus Merrill, who was born in Byron, uh, was part of the 1st Maine Veteran Infantry. He had originally been in the 7th Maine, but he, he earned the medal as a member of the 1st Maine Veterans. At Petersburg in April of 1863, so very close to the end of the war, a couple of days really before the end of the war, he entered the service at Linden, Maine, with six men, captured 69 Confederate prisoners, and recaptured several soldiers, meaning Union soldiers, who had fallen into enemy hands. And Frank Whitman, who joined from Woodstock, joined the 35th Mass. So two of these three are from here, but they're not listed on the quota, or the, they aren't listed as serving from the county, but they were from the county. Um, Entered service at Ayersville, Mass., was among the last to leave the field at Antietam, and was instrumental in saving the lives of several of his comrades at imminent risk of his own. At Spotsylvania, he got two citations, one medal, but for two reasons. At Spotsylvania, uh, two years later, a uh, year and a half later, was foremost in line in the assault when he lost a leg. So these are, this is the kind of stock that came from Oxford County, not always representative county, because they had, you know, moved on somewhere and enlisted elsewhere, but they were from here in, in the area. I put Colonel General Bean, I guess he became eventually, up here because that picture on the right is just so funny to look at. <laughs> <laughs> on the left is what he looked like as a first lieutenant in the 11th Maine Infantry. He became known as General Bean, quite a prominent local military career. He became the postmaster in Brownfield after the war. But he was in a band, I hope. <laughs> because otherwise I have no idea what that picture's all about. Uh, and he was just a postmaster, but he did march in the parades and you know, the GAR, the Grand Army of the Republic was sort of the equivalent of the American Legion for some war soldiers. And uh, he was active in that. But that big beefier hat really kind of gets my day. He did shave the middle of his beard and he shortened his beard from the war after. A lot of men kept those beards long after the war. It became a symbol of having been in the war. And even though beards fell out of style, in the 1880s, 90s, and so on. You could tell a Civil War veteran largely because he kept the beard. It was a, a symbol of having been a part of a, that time. And, uh, was, but in his case, he shaved a lot of that. There was one Native American, a Penobscot Indian from the county, uh, Laurent, or Laurent, he was called Laurent Newell, but it's probably the French Laurent, because most Native Americans have French names. He enlisted as a substitute in Company D of the 11th, worked as a basket maker, and camped at Crazy Knoll in Lock Mills. Lock Mills. His son, Sock Alexis Newell, settled in the Lock Mills area where he was well known. Lauren was a member of the Grand Army Republic and participated in every parade there was. So uh, there are not, except in the far west of Trans Mississippi, there are no real instances where groups of Native Americans fought as a unit or, or as a sub part of a unit. But there are lots of instances of, of Union soldiers, including. Um, who were Native Americans who happened to be living in a state and signed up as a Union soldier. I didn't look it up or put it up here too, but there are a number of Canadian soldiers who served in the Army from Maine. Partly because the bounty was good money. 300 bucks back then could buy you a, a small home in Maine. And uh, that's a lot of money. Especially a lot of poor Irish uh, signed up early on. A lot of the early units, particularly the 2nd Maine out of Bangor, had a lot of Irish in it because suddenly they went from living in the basement and you know having no money at all they could come back to the war by a house. Uh, a small one, but a house. Not, not to mention their monthly pay. And a lot of the letters, too, are when you left, you could assign a certain amount of your money. Soldiers generally chose $10, but they're 13 to be sent home instead of to them. And it would be deposited in the bank for you, and then the, the family could just go get the money, the wife or parents or whatever. Uh, so the idea of sending home 10 bucks a month and getting a new set of clothes and a new pair of shoes and 300 bucks to spend when you get home that's a pretty good enticement for a lot of people, including the poor, and particularly the Irish and Canadians who would come down, cross the border at Callis or, or from up above Colby Moor, and join up for the money because it was good number. Wars only going to last a month or two, right? <laughs> so they kept thinking. Uh, that's not really her, it's obviously a man but Sarah Prentice is one of those women who from Paris, Maine, not, not, <laughs> not uh, France. Volunteers and nurse in hospitals during the war, uh, where she contracted illnesses. Not at all remarkable when you consider the fact that one of the problems in the war is that uh, so many young men who lived out in the country and were never exposed to certain germs were suddenly thrust into a camp with men from the city who were never exposed to country germs and vice versa. And they swapped germs, and before long, a lot of them get sick. And of the 600,000 people who died as a result of the Civil War, 
more than half, well over half of those, really almost two-thirds of those, died as a result of disease, not as a result of wounds or battle. Uh, and to an extent, Sarah Francis is one of those. She served in the hospital where she came back in very poor health. She left for three years uh, to try and recover health and came back to the county and died essentially of the illnesses she had contracted being a nurse in the Civil War. She's not listed on a monument, but not listed as a casualty or a result of the war. She did live 13 or 14 years after her service, but she died, lived a, sort of like a soldier's pension who was wounded. She lived a, an unhealthy, sick life that was shortened greatly by her service in the war. But she was among those who served uh, along with Dorothea Dix from just south of Brewer, um, who went off and served in the hospital. And then in addition, I, I mentioned there were those women from Maine who went further from the hospitals, they went to the camps. Uh, and there's an enormous tradition, a great book called A Vast Army of Women, which lists literally every woman mentioned as having done anything from Maine during the course of the Civil War. I put Cindy in here because I thought it was interesting that all the time uh, during the war, there was a uh, fellow from Woodstock was the congressman of Maine's second district for three terms. And he was an enormous supporter of the soldiers and funding for the soldiers and aid for the soldiers. He was, uh, and it's interesting because we kind of live in a time where that's a political issue. How do you feel about the war? Do you support the troops? That kind of stuff. And back then it was as well. So the fellow from Woodstock who was in Congress, and then he replaced Joshua Chamberlain as governor of Maine. Chamberlain served four terms, uh, and in '74, um, Sydney became governor, largely because the, the biggest voting bloc, the dominant voting bloc in 1874, were Veterans who would come back from the war and control the legislature and the voting and so on. And so he was quite popular for his stand on the war, but his support of the troops too. So that was one politician. And then my favorite politician and soldier story combined is Hannibal Hamlin, who was mustered into Company A of the State Guards in July of 1864. They were assigned to Fort McClary in Kittery, still there right on the Piscataqua River. Hannibal reported for duty and served as a private and a cook in Company A of the State Guards, even though he was still the sitting vice president of the United States. <laughs> and in the records, it shows that he requested that he not receive pay or benefits. Because in one sense, it may be because he was wealthy enough he didn't have to. In another, it may be that he was already getting paid by the government because he was the vice president of the United States. <laughs> Can you imagine Dick Cheney showing up in a National Guard? <laughs> that's, that's what he did. The vice president, unless there was some serious vote in the Senate, which would took longer then than it does now, he could go to take the train to Washington in two days, he could be there, or a steamer. So he spent his time in Maine, in Bangor. He didn't really live in the what's now the Naval Observatory home where the vice president lives now. And he did his duty, so he joined up. Probably could have been an officer, but he joined up as a private. And in July, this is four months before the election where another person was nominated. This is after someone else was nominated to be Lincoln's vice president for the second term, but before the election. So he's the sitting vice president of the United States, slinging hash down at Fort McClary for the troops. Uh, another good story about him, the other big prominent family, and it's close to the county. In Livermore, of course, the Washburns, uh, Israel Washburn was the governor of Maine. Uh, they were one-year terms back then. And Israel wasn't the governor when was governor when the war broke out or in the early part of the war. And then of course it's the family that had three sons all in Congress at the same time from different states, each of them. Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Maine. Um, and uh, the famous the house, of course, in New Orleans and, and a very famous family politically around this time. But what's interesting is Hamilton Hamlin visited them once. His father built New Orleans, the original house that's now in New Orleans. It, you can almost not see the original house with all the porches and additions. But he would kid, kid them occasionally in Washington when he'd see one of the Washburns. And he would say, how's the house? And they'd say, oh, it's standing up fine. And we've entered into it. He goes, oh, we thought that. He said, it's no wonder that you know, your family has done so well. You were all raised in the house my father built. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Hannibal liked to credit the Washburn success with the walls that his father built that their family lived in. But, uh, it was interesting to know, and, and you know, 10 or 15 years later, James G. Blaine became, you know, should have been, or was given to be by the President of the United States. So this was a time when the Vice President, the important leaders in Washington were from Maine. Some of them from this neck of the woods. Aid at home was a very, very difficult, probably the hardest thing to deal with. Not a lot of glory, not a lot of medals and honors. 
that trying to, after the bounties were paid and the soldiers were sent, which was hard enough to do with what little resources the town had. Remember, the men who made money that might be given in taxes or whatever to the town were gone to war. So they were liability rather than income or revenue. Dear sir, this one is in April of 62, <coughs> Levi Dolloff of Company I, the main fifth regiment, Captain C.S. Edwards, died in service at Washington, 16, I think it was <coughs> April, uh, I can't remember the month now, but 1862, he was from February, I think it was, he was from this town. He only got as far as Washington and died of disease, so he'd only been enlisted a couple of months. Uh, he has a wife and one child. She has empowered me to obtain her pension of $8 per month for losing a husband in the war, as per act passed in April of 1861 to such persons. Will you please write me the necessary papers if any required to obtain it? There are lots and lots of letters from all over Maine and also from the county saying, my husband has died in the service, I'm destitute, I have no money, uh, how do I get the pension, and so on. And my favorite among these, perhaps of any kind, is for Mrs. Henry Jordan. In Bryant Pond, April 14th of 63, two months before Gettysburg. Dear Edgen General, <laughs> as my husband is in the Army and I have the privilege of drawing state aid, I would like to have you tell me if I have got to go to the selectmen three or four times and then not get it until they are mine to do it. <laughs> they keep it back three or four weeks after it's due and then I have to take an order if they say so. If there is anything for me to do, for me, I don't like to beg and tease for it. Yours in haste, this is Henry Joy. <laughs> so you get the picture that in Bryant Pond, she had marched herself down to the town hall to get her $8 a month, or whatever it was, or whatever he had set aside for her $10 a month, probably. And the selectmen apparently were kind of dangling it over her, not giving it to her, or something. So imagine being the adjutant general, and you're just getting inundated with thousands of these letters. And how do you, how do you do anything? You know, plus you spend you need powder and cannons and muskets and guns and troops at the front you need food and provisions and people need to be appointed. And you've got selectmen complaining because this guy's on the Rumford quarter and he's supposed to be on the Bethel quarter. And then you've got <laughs> fathers saying, where's my eight bucks? And mothers saying, how the damn selectmen aren't giving me my money? And just, oh! <laughs> imagine what it must have been like to be in Augusta and try to deal with all of these kinds of things. So, but I always thought that. I'm going to go down there three or four times until I get a manager. <laughs> lots and lots of those kinds of letters, which makes it a lot of fun to read. But the 4,216 Oxford County soldiers served in the war one way or the other. The, the county gave aid to 2,690 families, whether it was a bounty, a uh, pension, um, just aid. And the trouble, oh, I'll tell you a couple of stories in just a second. 7,778 7, people belonged in those, you know, 2,600 families. A total of 116000 almost $117,000 the county had to pay out, the towns in the county had to pay out to uh, soldiers for one reason or another, which was only 6% of Maine's total, which is about right, because the number of Maine men killed in the county, the number at all is about 6% of Maine's troops killed, wounded, and so on. Uh, I forgot to mention before, the town of uh, Rumford, for example, had 12 men killed in battle during the course of the war, 18 died of disease, which is higher than the normal ratio, but more died of disease than, than of uh, wounds, just from that one number total. But $116,000 in 1861 or two or five, that was a lot of money for a town that was trying to do everything else. And the saddest stories are the women who, uh, whose husbands went off and had the kids back at home and no longer a, a husband to care for the farm or an uncle or a brother because they all went too. Uh, and in one case, for example, the soldier was captured and mistakenly listed as a deserter when, in fact, he was in prison. So she was due, theoretically, every amount of aid that was available, as little as it was, but couldn't get it because he was listed as a deserter. So she's left at home, no way to take care of the kids. She ended up sending the kids out to different families, kind of renting them out to do work that they would live with that family and do some work and try to send some support home to the mother because until the husband was... So it was finally proven after a long period of time that the husband was actually captured and died in the prison camp in in Alabama. Um, so just being back home was a really difficult thing. Whether it was Sarah Prentice who went off to the war and died, or the things back home, it wasn't just, oh, no bullets and cannonballs are flying past you, but it was not an easy thing to be back here at the home front. It was a draining situation for everybody. The biggest impact the war had on the state of Maine, and in a couple of more, well, maybe, <coughs> 11 more years, we, by prediction, we won't be able to say this anymore, 
But only once in the history of the state of Maine has the population from one census to the next dropped. And that was the census from 1860 to 1870. And largely the reason was that men went off to war and they went into a field in Virginia in the midst of a battle and said, hey, there's no rocks here. <laughs> and they came back from Louisiana and said, it's not cold there. <laughs> and the government said, you can have, as a part of your service, 167, I think it was, acres out west. West then was Iowa, uh, Minnesota, places like that. You can have that land free as part of your service. No one else was living there, and the country was moving west, except they were going all the way to California. So there was a chunk of land in the middle, and the government was giving it away. So they said, is it like Virginia or is it like Maine? Oh, it's just like Virginia. Flat, open, grow, things grow in it before the seed hits the ground. And so up and out they went. Now, two of the Washburn brothers went to Minnesota and Wisconsin and started Gold Medal Flower and King Arthur Flower. The Gold Medal King Arthur? Or Pillsbury? Who's Gold Medal King Arthur? Pillsbury? Uh, as an example, there was opportunity out there. Um, Delbert Ames, the, the first commander of the 20th Maine, his, he'd grown up on his father's ships as a cabin boy. He was from Rockland, and his father went out to Minnesota and started a, a grain, you know, flour making mill. And you know, lifelong family tradition for generations of being ships, ship people, sailing people. They went west because there was opportunity. There was less cold, although Minnesota is probably not a whole lot. Longer. But there was, you know, flat fields without boulders in it. What the heck are we living in Maine for? And so there was an enormous exodus. Of course, the railroad was completed, and and you know, people could go all the way out west and. There had been a beginning of a little bit, you know, the, the gold rush in 1849 and so on. But there was an enormous movement west, and a lot, lot of it was soldiers had gone away and seen the world and came home and said, I don't want to live on the side of the hill and move rocks around every time I plant corn and have to get it in early because it's going to freeze by late July. <laughs> and so um, a lot of it was that. And it took, Oxford County, for example, suffered more than most counties. Uh, Maine lost 1% of its population in that period of time. Oxford County lost 7%. Right. So um, if you look at that, it took until 1930 for Oxford County's population to, to get back to its 1860 level. So the war you know, took a pretty heavy toll on the, on the communities here in terms of people just leaving. And it makes sense, the further up toward the mountains you get, the further you realize, why can't I go out to Iowa where it's flat and easy to grow and so on. So they say, in, in the, the prediction is in the 2020 census, Maine will lose a slight, the, first, the second time in its history, drop slightly in, in the size of its population. So those are just some of those things that I hope are fairly interesting to you, but give you a sense that it isn't necessarily all about battles and soldiers and, and those kind of things, that a lot more back home that isn't probably a whole lot different from today. Of course, Stan Lee is a selectman now, and he probably inundated with things less earth-shattering than a war, but just as annoying. <laughs> and letters and demands from people to do this and that and the other thing. And you might have a son in the war and a brother, and you're still trying. It, it just was not an easy time for anybody, whether you were back home or working as a nurse in a hospital or actually out in the field uh, fighting uh, for the country. So it was quite a dramatic time all the way around. Now, as Stan and I mentioned, I brought some books. If you'd like to get one, and I'll scribble in it for you. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Stan stood up, which helps me. So if you have any questions about the county and the Civil War, would like to ask them. And I can't answer them. I'm sure Stan could. Uh, but if you're shy and you want to come up afterwards and talk, I'll be happy to stick around long enough for everyone to ask a few questions. Yes? I was struck by your discussion about how unprepared these troops were when they were sent off. Is there any way of estimating or any correlation between that lack of preparedness and the appalling number of soldiers who were killed in the war? Yeah, and early on in particular, I mean, Bull Run was just a mess, yeah. and um, and it took a long while. And it's interesting because that recruit, the recruiter that I read about, he talked about women, mothers chasing him off his, off their land with a pitchfork, <laughs> and uh, you know the difficulties he had getting the kids away from the parents, and and then he he in particular had a really difficult time because he was their captain because he had recruited more of them. And they started to drop when they first got to Washington from disease and so on, and then he would order them in battle and they'd get killed. And it suddenly occurred to him that they died because he convinced them to join, snuck them away from their mother, and now they're dead. And they had a, he in particular, he moved away from, he couldn't stay in Maine anymore, because every time he walked down the street, he'd see somebody whose son he had killed in, yeah. in, his, in his mind, you know. 
and he struggled with it tremendously. But yeah, it took a long period of time. The 20th was grateful in that they ran, they, they took a, the 20th made, went to Washington and literally jogged to Antietam to get there in time. Yeah. And one of the companies, about halfway there, one of the companies, they would stop every so often, stopped and there was one guy left in the company. Yeah. <laughs> and he drew himself up and salute, performed a maneuver and <laughs> made a company presentation because he's the only one left out of a thousand, a hundred men in the company. So they, they had, I mean, they, they were literally, only two of the companies even had weapons when they first got to Washington. Um, so, uh, because in as much as the adjutant general was struggling, there were men all through the levels of the War Department and the Army trying to, you know, 300,000 troops all coming and trying to get them all powder and muskets and assignments. And, um, they were fortunate and they got to Antietam and then the war kind of paused most, for most of the winter. Uh, so they had all winter to, to drill and learn and, and prepare so that um, when they were engaged, really Gettysburg was the first time, they, they had a battle at Fredericksburg where they got a sense of it trained again all winter, had the smallpox for Chancellorsville, so they got held out. Uh, but that was a little bit unusual. They had time. The first units went off with some basic semblance of, of military drill because they'd been in the militia. But a militia muster was more of a family picnic than it was anything to do with the military. Uh, but at least they had tried once or twice. <laughs> you know, they tried to put on a show. Uh, but yeah, it, was, it had a lot to do with it. But um, fortunately, there were enough people, and there seems to be a lot of this in Maine. I'm not sure if there's the adjutant general. A lot of people who went out like that as recruited from companies came back a month or two later. And I'm not sure if it was other officers or people along the way said, you need to go home. And they we were kind of convinced one way or the other. And oftentimes, some officer in another Maine regiment already in the field would be brought and promoted and dropped in to, the, to a regiment and to, to help, you know, bring it up to some military standard. But they were not, I mean, they literally had, some of them, they never been hunting before. They had no idea what they were doing. And they, if the 20th had been in battle at Antietam, it, it, they'd have been, it'd have been a mess because the, the regiments around them were very experienced. But they, they literally, had, they didn't know how to drill. So uh, it was a tough, difficult. I think we better end it here okay. and, uh, and let people come up and talk to you individually. Sure, absolutely. Let's give you a break.